And we're back, continuing in our journey of the gospel according to St. John. We covered verse 14, chapter 1, verse 14 last time. We're going to kick off with verse 14 uh, to make one more point, and then we're going to keep going through verses 15 and 16. Let's read it, starting at 1.14, going through 16. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Verse 15, John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And verse 16, and of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. Going to verse 14 to catch the uh, tale conclusionary, we read, And the word was made flesh, full of grace and truth. If you look at the word made flesh in the womb of Mary, we know that the position, that is the fetal position of the baby, is in a figure six. From his head at the top and the curled portion right here. Now, this coming of the word made flesh, this was truly the grace of God coming to impart something to us, the salvation of the Lord. When it was time to come out, as the fetus does, it turns upside down, prepares to enter the world head first or upside down. This marks man's judgment, that man is judged. He enters the world judged. And now we see this part here coming up and curling to make a nine. This is the harsh truth. So, as the Word was made flesh, truly the expression of grace and truth is seen and found from the beginning of his time as a baby. Also, John 1, keep in mind, is New Testament number 69 in the order of chapters. So this is a very strong point that we want to observe. Jesus, full of grace and truth, no doubt. We're going to move on to verse 15. John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. A. John, that's John the Baptist, not to be confused with John, the gospel writer, bear witness of him, Jesus. A. 1. John the Baptist, bear witness outwardly. This is so important because as a Christian, if you have not understood that it is all about the inward reality, then you have hardly begun to understand what walking with the Lord is all about. And John the Baptist, he could only bear witness outwardly. And we see in verse 7 and 15, 7 we covered many programs ago, but here it's happening again in verse 15. He's, according to the program that he is in, which would be program 1, Israel, prophecy, can only do an outward thing. Because the inward reality that is going to make the sons of God had not come yet. Outwardly, outwardly, John is bearing witness of Jesus as the last prophet of Program 1, Israel Prophecy. Now, John, who's also bearing witness of Jesus in the Gospel according to John, which we're going through, he... John the Apostle, bear witness inwardly. We see that when we conclude here in verse 16. Let's just sneak peek. Remember, John says this, and of his fullness 
have all we received and grace for grace? Notice that. Notice that when he says, and of his fullness have all we received, he's excluding John. Because this John, John the Apostle, he is of the church. And so the fullness and the grace for grace was all given to the church. So John the Apostle, he had an inward, an inward witness that he bears of Jesus. So you have to understand as the church, you are responsible for the inward reality and that that is the witness you are bearing. Now back to John the Baptist. It says, and cried, this is John the Baptist, a voice crying in the wilderness, and cried, saying, this was he of whom I spake. Now he's pointing to this central message right here, the centrality of the word made flesh. This was lost by Israel because they did not heed the cry. And they forsook the cry of John the Baptist. And so it was given to the Gentiles. The centrality of the word made flesh lost by Israel to the centrality of the word made flesh by the church. A cry is born. Here, a cry was rejected, a cry of John the Baptist. But here, in the church, a cry is born within us. Remember? The six and the nine? That's what's entering into us. And we, being born again, those who are in the church, the cry is born inwardly into us. Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh. The centrality of the Word made flesh lost by the church. What? Yeah. You see, the church is waxing and waning into a Laodicean condition. And the cry is being lost. When you lose the centrality of Christ, you lose the cry. See? The centrality of Christ. See what's in that word? C-R-Y. You cannot lose the centrality of Christ in your life as a Christian. We're going to go to, He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. Point C. C-1. Here we go. Now Jesus was after John. We're talking about born after. Jesus born after John. But he was preferred, John says, even though John was of a higher age than Jesus. The reason is because of the preeminence of Christ that John the Baptist was recognizing. Paul the Apostle brings this to the church in Colossians, that it's all about the preeminence of Christ. And John the Baptist, as the last prophet, he was recognizing that even though Jesus was born after him, he was to be preferred before him. Luke one thirty six, And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month she was six months pregnant with John the Baptist when Mary had just been impregnated with the Lord Jesus. So John the Baptist had a clear six-month spread over Jesus in age. And we see here, interestingly enough, that the time Mary visits is a testimony because it was the sixth month out of nine, the Savior was visiting John the Baptist, full of the grace 
of six, that he was being made a man to be the salvation and truth, that he was coming to bear the judgment, full of grace and truth. At the time, he first meets John. He first met John when they were each in the womb. Point two, the word was before John, but preferred. This is the preeminence of Christ in this signification, that though he was born after John, in the beginning was the word. He was the word made flesh. And John the Baptist had an understanding, keen awareness, and an insight that he was dealing with someone who was not in the confinement of time, but was the Word made flesh, the Word who was in the beginning. John had a tremendous instinctual, spirit-given, spirit-filled understanding. Everything was working for John the Baptist. And I have written here, let's see, in either case, as the six or the nine, a Jesus will have the preeminent place. Yes, this is true. Whether he is the man, Christ Jesus, or he's the sin bearer, in either case, he will have the preeminence. Glorified as the man of God or recognized as the great Savior. No matter what he does, he's going to come forth with that preeminence. And so Jesus agrees with John. In Revelation twenty two sixteen, 16, he agrees with John in this way because he does say, I am the root and the offspring of David. See, he was not only before John, but he was before David. He is the eternal word of God. All right, verse 16a, which is the red portion here, and of his fullness have all we received. And of his fullness have all we, this is program two, the church, received. Israel rejected the fullness, but we, the church, have received it. And it required the crucifixion, burial, resurrection, and ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ in order for program two, the church, to receive the fullness. And so in the course of time, it has come. And truly, truly, we have received all of his fullness. And this is being told to us in John 1.16, because even as the centrality of Christ, the Word made flesh, the indwelling Christ, so the, intra the centrality of the Word made book, the lowercase w Word of God, the 1611 King James Bible. These 116 verses, famous ones, such as Romans 116, etc., they mirror the 1611 King James Bible revelation. This one, one in the middle of 116, mirrors to the right a 16 and mirrors to the left an 11. Remember, when you're looking into the 1611 King James Bible, you're looking into the mirrored face of God because every face mirrors. See this? Left side, right side paradigm. Even twins, they become mirrored facing. Twin and twin. So we shouldn't be surprised. When we start to examine verses in the 116 slots, we see a very tight identification with the Word of God. Just like it says here, and of his fullness have all we program to the church received who received the fullness of the word the completion and maturity of the word of god well that was in 1611 king james bible the responsibility of the church from there on out john 116b and grace for grace i think this is a puzzling expression in fact, I've never heard 
or known or read or seen anyone who has taught it as this. And I'm sure that someone out there is because this is a precision of truth right here. And surely I'm not the only one to receive truth from the Father. And grace for grace is understood by seeing its opposite. Because the opposite of grace for grace is this right here. I for I. That's Leviticus 24.20. Jesus spoke this in Matthew 5.38. And tooth for tooth, also mentioned in those two scriptures. So grace for grace is the opposite of eye for eye and tooth for tooth, the judgment of the law. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth. This is always an expression of condemnation, which means a subtraction. Because when you condemn, you are taking away. You are taking away rights, freedoms. You are demolishing, condemning, destroying. You're breaking apart, breaking down, and doing away with judging, removing. See, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth is always a condemnation. And that means a subtraction. But grace for grace is always a justification and an addition. When Jesus came, Grace for grace, he came to justify by his death on the cross and to add unto us a sanctification and a glorification. What an addition. What an addition grace for grace is. Grace does not mean overlooking. Examine grace in the scriptures, and you'll see that it is always about an impartation and a building up, a raising up, and an exalting. This is a powerful verse. I hope that this verse blesses you as we continue on in our travels through the Gospel of John.